My name is Tom Ryan. I'm with WPS Provider Outreach and Education. Today, we're here to talk about Medicare Secondary Payer or MSP. We're going to look at some tips and tricks for working with this and hopefully get you this information. Um, Aline Ziegler is monitoring. You've heard her probably a few different times now as we've had some technical difficulties. Um, the tips and tricks really are coming from us and we're really trying to help you through the different information that is going on. So I want to make you uh, as aware of that as I can. Now, what we want to do is, again, if there are information, we'll have you put those in the chat. I will see if Aline will read that out to me versus me trying to do any other method of um, information. Our next slide is a housekeeping slide, and I want to let you know this presentation is available to you. It is available on the training center. Um, it is in live events right now. However, at the end of today, it's going to be removed from live events or tomorrow morning. Then you'll have to wait for us to post it into Encore presentations. That will be done as quickly as possible. Now, we'll let you know that if the quality of this is not good, obviously, you've heard me say a couple of different times there's some problems. We will not be posting this into Encore presentation. If, however, you do need the material or you would like it, then feel free to drop us um, information. And by that, email us. We'll get the uh, PowerPoint out to you along with everything else. So send questions and comments in the chat. Again, I do want to receive those, and I would love to hear from you on those. I'll take and answer those as best I can. I will let you know that you will be receiving a survey. Um, the survey is the opportunity to tell me what I did good, what I did bad, uh, what the PowerPoint looked like, all those good things, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, hopefully, okay with me and, and some of the technology issues we've already started off facing, so we're getting started just a couple of minutes late. For those of you that have attended, for those of you that have attended our uh, presentations before, the material is available to you again it, it was current and it is about um, staying current with information so it is current right now however we all know that medicare rules can change and so you want to make sure you watch the cms website for the current rules regulations coverage all those types of things what has changed in 2024 there was just a question that was asked of me uh, regarding medicare secondary payer and the answer is really hasn't changed in 2024 However, we do continue to have issues and we do continue to see different problems and other things and those are what we're here to address today. Okay. Um, I will take question and answers again through the chat. If I don't get to them, what we'll do is take those question and answers and I'll email you back a document later. I would not expect that until late next week, but we'll get all those answered. I want to give you guys time to get them in and, you know, um, give seven days to get whatever in there and I'm going to try to do one big document with everything in it. So also keep in mind, information giving in those question and answers has become um, information that I can answer based on that. However, details do matter. So if you put more in or you say, well, based on this and based on this, I've got this additional, then we wind up with, with um, a variety of different answers and some of them really can change the current information. So I want to make you guys aware of that right away. What are we here to talk about? Again, we are here to talk about Medicare as a secondary payer. Um, and we're here to talk about tips for getting things processed correctly, doing things correctly, other items like that. Our goal is to get you to avoid denial. Once we do that, we want to talk about some of the basics. Now, these basics were put in to answer the questions that you submitted as part of the basic information, because I was literally asked for what is MSP basics and can you start there? So I will do that. Now we're going to talk about some tips to avoid denials. And then um, as time permits, we'll look at some resources. I will tell you the resources are all listed in the presentation. So they're there for you. I'll talk a little bit about them if time permits. So let's go ahead and get started with the basics. And the basics are, are again here to address the people that are not familiar or are new. Now it is not an in-depth demonstration of everything related to MSP. For those of you that do not know, this is actually a nine part course covering the basics, covering billing, covering all those different items. So there are times when I'm going to put that information out there and that's how I'm going to say it. Hey, if you want more information, review the Encore for this because this portion right here is broken into a lot of different components. But getting started, what is the definition of Medicare Secondary Payer or MSP? The basic definition is when another payer does not need to be a health insurance company, considers the charges before Medicare. 
In other words, someone else may be responsible for charges. I want you to take note of what I just said, that it does not need to be another health insurance company. A payer can be something like a store or some other business uh, building where someone fell and they didn't have proper insurance. So now they become what's considered self-insured. Now, we do not use the term pay. Why do we not say, hey, this other payer has to pay? Well, what if they deny saying in terms of a worker's um, an employment insurance, this just isn't part of, we don't offer a benefit for this. Well, then it's denied for coverage and we could consider it as primary. What if it's the start of the year and they apply it to their deductible? That's okay. Or what if they say, well, we paid our allowed amount. We're only going to pay up to this amount on this service. And this is the contracted agreement. So it's not about necessarily always paying. Though I do want to make it clear it can be a payment. So Medicare secondary payer, some people get confused over the fact that they're not actually paying and it's a consideration. Hopefully that does answer those questions related to that super high level information there. Moving on, we're going to put in the next question which was when Medicare looks at it, how do we divide out our types of payments? And how do we divide out what we call our primary payers? And we have two basic categories, and one is group health plans, the second is non-group health plans. These are the two big types. Now in a group health plan, the key thing to remember is that they are employment-based plans. And then once you know that it's an employment-based plan through active employment of the person their spouse, a legal guardian, or someone else who they're eligible under active employment, then we use Medicare eligibility to determine whether Medicare is primary or not. Now, Medicare eligibility means are they eligible due to being 65 or age related? So this is the person, not necessarily who has the plan. So remember, a spouse could be 62, still working, they have employment that Medicare person is 68 and does not is not actively working. Their plan is through their spouse. However, because they're 68, it's considered a working age plan. And we look at the number of employees that are within that. And that's 20 or more to determine whether Medicare is primary. Over 20 Medicare is um, secondary, under 20 Medicare is primary. We also then look at how a person is eligible for Medicare if they have disability. So this is under 65 and they are disabled, deemed social security disabled. This is what we call a large group health plan. And the difference here is it's 100. The number becomes 100. It is 100 eligible people for the plan, which means they have 100 eligible people on this plan. They are primary. Anything below that, Medicare is primary. So the difference, again, you can see is age related and how they're eligible. The last category that Medicare uses is what's called end stage renal disease. And this is Medicare eligibility based on end stage renal disease. So yes, it's important to understand that when we look at group health plans, if a person has Medicare due to end stage renal disease, they do not have the same type of coverage. In other words, this is a different section of the law. And what this one says is that we use a coordination period. So for the first 30 months, the other insurance is primary. After that time frame passes, then Medicare becomes primary. This one, this end stage renal disease eligibility does not take into account the number of employees at all. However, and stage renal disease goes on further to say that during this section of the law that COBRA still applies during the first 30 months. So if you're eligible for end stage renal disease and you're under a COBRA coverage, you'll use the same rules. However, working aged and large group health plans do not apply COBRA. So it just depends on which section of the law you're looking for. All right, so there's a lot of Going back and forth with it, uh, one of the questions we got is how does Medicare secondary payer work when there's a retroactive eligibility for a large group health plan under disability? They actually just said under disability. And the answer is it can still work for you if you filed the claim. And we're going to talk more about that in another tip, and I will get more into that. But please remember filing the claim becomes key if they're deemed disabled and we have to have the claim on file. Timely filing does not waiver for this. Okay. 
Let's briefly talk about non-group health plans next. And non-group health plans are unrelated to insurance. Uh, I'm sorry, unrelated to employment. What they are related to is an accident, illness, or injury. This means that only, only the services related to that accident, illness, or injury, this group health plan will be primary for. Unlike employment-based plans, which are everything, everything they're primary for, okay? Medicare then breaks this into four caveats, and one of those are four different areas, liability and no faults, workers' compensation, and federal black lung. We did have a question of what makes the difference between liability and no faults, and it is a state definition. For instance, an auto insurance in one state could be considered liability, while in another state, it could be considered no fault. Also, um, this person stated that they actually worked um, on a border between a couple of different states, and sometimes workers' compensation in one state is different than it is in another state. Understand that because workers' compensation laws are actually passed by the state, so it's not going to be the same from state to state. So that's not uncommon for us to face as we do have more than one state. However, for the most part, workers' compensation remains the same. And the federal black lung is not a workers' compensation coverage done by the state. It is actually done by the federal government. It's the Department of Labor. They determine diagnoses that must be submitted to this program. So it is a little different than regular workers' compensation, though it is a form of it, and a lot of the workers' compensation rules do apply. Um, the next question, or the next slide that we got, is, <laughs> sorry. When is Medicare always primary? So someone asked for examples of this. And first of all, Medicare will always be primary to Medicaid. That makes sense because Medicaid is the payer of last resort. The law states that Medicare um, is primary to TRICARE, but TRICARE can pay the deductible or the patient liability amount for Medicare. Now, TRICARE also does that offer some other portions of payment. Medicare Advantage is not primary or secondary to traditional fee-for-service, Part A and B Medicare. Medicare Advantage is considered Part C. This is a replacement plan. This is a common misconception. If Medicare, traditional Medicare, and the patient has a Medicare Advantage plan, we cannot pay. We will not consider and we won't do anything. So that's tip number one. There are also plans called Medigap plans. These plans are contracted with CMS. You're required to put claim information. Uh, I'm sorry, you're required to put their information on the claim, and this will cross over to us. Now, along with Medigap, there's also something called a supplemental coverage. These plans are from private companies, just like Medigap, but the plan specifically states that they offer Medicare coverage for non paid items. A Medicare supplemental plan can offer some additional benefits that a Medigap plan will not. Medigap plan are designed simply to cover patient liability should Medicare not pay. Supplement plans are contracted plans. These plans also contract for us to send information to them. Did you catch that? For us to send information. They can exclude certain things saying, you know what, if you do uh, mental health, for instance, we want certain things on the claim. Medicare doesn't require that. Therefore, we don't take any of those claims. So supplemental plans. The last one is very, very common. And we had, I think, four or five questions on this. Is the Veterans Administration primary to Medicare or is Medicare primary to the Veterans Administration? And the answer is neither. Neither one of those. The law states that if one pays, the other will not. If one federal benefit program pays, the other cannot. And the VA is considered a federal benefit program. Okay, now remember, so is TRICARE, but I said TRICARE only pays for patient liability amounts. That's not what we paid. They won't cover our lot amount. With the Veterans Administration, it's an all or nothing. They pay 100% and they don't leave patient liability. Therefore, there's nothing to go with. Now, if you said, but they didn't give me an authorization, so then who's primary? Well, then you're gonna bill it to us, letting us know that it was not authorized and we will take primary payment. But it is not a secondary claim, similar to what you're thinking of based on those other items. So again, if you have questions, put those in chat and we'll get those answered a little bit more fully for those. I hope that does make sense. 
The next item that goes with Medicare secondary payer is what are the provider responsible for? First of all, there's a lot of rules and regulations and the provider is responsible for knowing them and making sure they bill accordingly and effectively with those rules and regulations. That may seem overwhelming as a task. That's why providers have staff. That's also why providers use um, certain billing companies and agencies. But ultimately, if you receive the payment, you're responsible for making sure that it gets billed correctly and that you know the information. Keep in mind, this does include all the regulatory information, all of the information on the official Medicare website, cms.gov, and anything else. One person asked, okay, the provider is responsible for knowing this, but what if we don't know? How do we get the patient information, or what if the patient's not understanding? Then you refer that patient to 1-800-MEDICARE and you let them ask that question. Again, you're gonna refer them to 1-800-MEDICARE. There are times when some of the intricacies and in how the patient works, you're not going to be familiar with. Also some of the coordination stuff, let the patient determine that on their own if they need to. The provider is also responsible for determining primary coverage. So what does that mean? The provider must ask the patient questions. We're gonna talk about the MSP questions coming up next, also commonly referred to as the MSP questionnaire. The provider must verify with system stuff if they can't get any information. What type of stuff? Eligibility checks that contain this information. It is their job to determine whether or not something is related or unrelated for those non-employer group health plans. If it denies for it being a related diagnosis, then it's their job to file the appeal to show that it is unrelated. One thing that was asked a lot is, do we have tips for billing? And the answer is, there's a lot of stuff out there about billing and the intricacies of in and out of Medicare secondary payer billing as two completely separate classes and each one takes an hour to teach. So rather than trying to get too much into those billing, I'm gonna get some information in chat. Um, it might also it is the provider's responsibility to bill timely now billing timely is something that you have to be aware of um, and the reason that we say that with billing timely is that it's not an exception the exception is not there you get one year to bill an msp claim however if they haven't made a decision can you still bill that yes you can bill it but expect that we will deny it once it denies, what you want to do then is to um, appeal or to go through the claims process. It could be a reopening, clerical error reopening, um, or whatever the situation is, once we get that information. So it's in the system, we've got it, now we just got to work with it later, typically done through a variety of different processes. Also, someone asked about this one, and do they have to collect those patient liabilities if there's something left over? And yes, you do. It's still your responsibility to collect patient liabilities. If you could provide that service without collecting those patient liabilities for that one patient, as a general rule, why are you not doing it for all patients? Keep in mind that doesn't count the financial aspects saying, hey, we went out to this patient, they can't financially afford it, or here's the information for a one-time waiver. That's fine, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just saying, you don't file, you don't ask the patient, you don't do anything and you automatically waive off those liabilities because you're gonna get enough inform that's not acceptable for Medicare. You have to collect the patient liability. Okay. So let's move on and we're gonna move on to the next section, maybe. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next slide. The next slide talks about the MSP questions. Commonly referred to as the MSP questionnaire. The MSP questionnaire are used to determine whether there is primary coverage. Now the questions themselves are not required, but they are required to be asked at least in some manner and you are required to gather certain pieces of information. That's why Medicare has the questions and they have them laid out in the way that they do. So if you want to go out and actually read the questions, go out to chapter three in the Medicare secondary payer manual and look for section 20. This will give you the questions. So what are the questions trying to determine? And the basic gist of these questions and what they're trying to determine is, 
One, does the patient have another coverage? That makes sense. Two, does the coverage come before or after Medicare today? Or is it not applicable? Because remember with those non-group health plans, it's related to a certain condition. That's what we're looking for. So we want to keep this information current and up to date. Now I could go out and show you how it's built and you can take a look at those questions. We don't typically do that because you also have the option to print down a screen or to show the patient a screen. So let's say that the information is within the WPS uh, portal and you're going out there and you're showing the patient that, okay, yep, looks good. Awesome, you can write verified patient information in the portal with a date, we're good. Um, could you use directed entry? Yes, you can use any system that you have. So it's not necessarily about asking other questions. However, you do need to make sure that something is still current today. How often do you need to do this? CMS has two different answers and it depends on the claim form type of claim you bill. For a UB04 claim form or an 837i electronic, you must do this at the start of every care or every admission. So even if they're discharged for two days and then they're admitted again, as long as that admission is considered two separate admissions, you do it again. It states if there is a reoccurring service, then yes, you do it at the start of care, but then you have to do it every 90 days following. What would be a reoccurring service? How about physical therapy? You're expecting them to come back X amount of weeks, X amount of times during that week. Instead of asking them at every single physical therapy visit, you're only gonna ask them every 90 days. Chemotherapy would be another one. It's something where we expect to see this patient back, okay? Now it is a little bit different for the CMS 1500 claim form and the 837P electronic claims because some of these providers see people more frequently. So what they say at the start of care, this makes sense. Again, it's the first time you see the patient, you wanna make sure you have the accurate record. If you don't ask questions, you don't get the information. But then it goes on with a little bit more of a generic statement and it says as often as needed to keep accurate records. Now that is my summary of how they say it. It is not the exact verbiage, but that's really what it means. Here's the thing, that is a correct statement and no, it is not determined. But do you not wanna ask those questions? Do you not want to determine and have a responsibility to determine whether you should build Medicare and whether that continues to be accurate? How would you know if a person's spouse retired and maybe their employer-based plan ended? You have to ask the questions. So WPS will always recommend following the 90 day rule. Every 90 days, if you haven't seen a patient within that time frame, or it has been 90 days since you previously asked, ask again. Again, that is a recommendation. It is not a requirement. Okay. Now it is a requirement for UB04 or 837I billers. All right, again, check, check out that section of the IOM should you want more information. I think it might help you uh, get what you need there. Okay, patient responsibility seems to be a bigger question here. So I do wanna talk about the patient responsibility. Um, one of the things that we did give you is a booklet that can help the patient themselves understand. It's from medicare.gov versus um, the CMS website that you guys are familiar with. Medicare.gov is the patient website for Medicare. So do you need to bill the patient? Absolutely. What are the patient responsibilities? One, they should provide you with all insurance cards they have. Two, they should provide you with any information they know. Okay. It is ultimately their responsibility to keep their records current. But if you know about something, it's your responsibility to bill that. What could you know about? Well, you could know that there's an insurance, but you're not sure if it's primary or secondary. It's your responsibility to make sure that insurance gets built and together the information. It's also um, the patient's responsibility just to get the basic information. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, if you look at this booklet, this is a booklet designed just for this purpose. However, there is a booklet called Medicare and You. This is a handout or a booklet that is available to every patient. It's sent to them annually. There is a section in there for Medicare primary payer or Medicare secondary payer. Um, depends on how the verbiage is that year. That is what they're required to know. Everything else is optional for them to know. I do recommend though, again, 1-800-MEDICARE, should you need it, have it ready. So when you ask what the patient should do, here's their shoulds. Now, can Medicare or can we force them to do that? 
Uh, we as a Mac cannot, we do not work with the patients. That's not done through us at all. So the benefit coordination and recovery center will work with them to update that information. It's an, you may hear it referred to as the MSP contractor as well. Their job is to keep that information up to date. They'll ask questions, send out questionnaires and do all of those different things in general. So we wanted to provide you with a resource that may help, but again, we don't work directly with the patients. We don't have that um, specific resource. We, on the other hand, do offer the provider guidance and provider information. Okay. The next slide brings us to our first set of questions. What I would like to do just um, on this particular slide is to start off with some pre-submitted questions. And then what we will do from there is set up if we have any questions yet. So the question that I haven't gone over quite yet that is applicable during this slide is, is it common to see MSP replacements to commercial insurance? Um, MSP replacements commonly with Medicare is referred to or is a, the word replacement means Part C plans. Yes, a person can have a Part C plan and commercial insurance. I'm not sure when you're talking about MSP replacements to commercial insurance, what else you would be referencing here, which is why I put this uh, so far up in the ball game so that if I can get you some more information, hopefully I can answer your questions. Um, I'm not even going to try to look at chat. Alina, I'm going to rely on you to look at chat and give me any questions that you have. Yeah, I understand that. You're doing great. Um, our first question, I'm just going to ask these in the order in which they were submitted. How do you get a claim submitted if billed for charges not related to liability, no fault, or workers comp? If the charges are non-related to the accident, illness, or injury, it usually always still rejects stating liability primary even when the services are not related. Is there a certain modifier, condition code, or anything that needs to be placed on the claim? This is a question that we get very commonly. And the answer is there is nothing that you can directly place on the claim. Now, some people have said um, we've had it be successful when we've used the narrative or the comments field. It depends on the type of claim that you bill, and that has worked. I'm not going to say don't do that. It's just something some other people have said. Here's how that works. The benefit system, the coordination system uses a diagnosis code and a family relating to that diagnosis code. So if that's on there, it automatically denies. It's a system edit. It's not an, uh, it is something that can be overridden, but commonly overridden during the appeals process, during that review process. It's not something that's overridden right away. Um, and I don't have any further advice on that. I'm going to ask Elaine, maybe she does. I don't know if she's seen something I haven't. Well, sometimes it depends on your relationship with that other insurance too. Um, if you know it's not related, you could consider sending it to that other insurance anyway and getting a denial and then billing Medicare. It just depends on your, you know, how much time each insurance takes. So that's another um, thing that you could consider. Thanks, Aline. Uh, could we go on to the next question? Yes, the next question says, how do we let you know that we did not receive authorization from VA? Um, so what you can do on that one is you can bill it to Medicare as primary. And again, it's gonna depend on how you bill. There are certain coded uh, pieces of information that would be um, on a UBO4 that would tell us that. Um, but if you don't bill on a UBO4 and you bill in a 50, I should say UBO4 837I electronic transaction, 1500 837P uh, electronic transaction, the uh, other way that will happen is if you deny on the, the 1500, there's nothing we can do to override that one. Um, and then you have to go back through and ask us to look at it. And so um, that can be done through an appeal, that can be done through a clerical error reopening. There's a variety of different things that can be done with that one. but. Uh, initially, um, again, if you're billing on a 1500, this is where the more common question comes in. There isn't anything we can do. We do have to let it deny and then go back and look at the review of it. Next. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. When our patient states the MSP information on WPS is incorrect, but doesn't call to update the information, how can we have the information updated so our claims will submit without rejection or denial for other insurance and we are unable to be reimbursed? Okay, uh, this is gonna be a tip also coming in a little bit, but I'll just briefly summarize it here. Got a couple of options. One, 
go to that primary insurance and get a termination date, an end date, or a effective date. Get all the information you can on letterhead from them that can be sent to the BCRC. That's available on the CMS website. If you type BCRC, that's an acronym for Benefit Coordination and Recovery Center. It'll bring you to their contact information. You'll get that. The other option would be to simply bill them, get a denial, and then for that one claim, you're going to bill each claim with the denial, and Medicare will consider it based on that. So if you can't get it updated, then you do have to use the billing system, bill it, and get it done that way to get um, a denial for that claim, and then we'll look at that individually. So again, not, not the best answer I got for you, but the, the easiest one is to go to them, go to the other insurance, ask them, and then have that information sent to you with the, with the date. Next question. When can we bill the patient if they do not give us primary insurance info and will not respond to our phone calls to try to obtain that information? So you first have to be able to um, have that information. So if you're saying I, I've never gotten it, the patient won't respond. One, you should always be checking our systems to see, right? If on the other hand, you've done that and you verified you should have seen the patient originally, right? So depending, can you tell me, you know, did, when you saw the patient, did you ask the questions? Did you follow the guidelines that I gave you on that previous slide where we talked about MSP questions? If you did and you verified, then you're going to go ahead and bill it. Um, if you didn't and you can't get that information, that's a refusal and you can document that. There's some legal actions you could ask um, your legal representatives on what to take with those actions. We can't advise you on that uh, because it's a legal action. We can't advise on any type of a legal action. Next question. There are no further questions at this time. Okay. We are going to try to move on. Um, while I was talking, my computer has been cycling in a very weird manner. So, Aline, can you see the tips slide? Yes, I can. All right. Let's hope this works. Here we go. Uh, so the first tip that I have for you is to provide this service. This is coming from CMS and CMS has said, hey, as a provider, you should be providing services. They've gone so far as to write an article and a booklet on this saying, hey, don't deny services just because they have this Medicare secondary payer. You want to deny or you want to provide them and then bill them correctly. So that's our first tip, provide the service, but then make sure it gets billed correctly. Now, Someone asked, if we have tried and done this, we've now got a backlog in the patient, are we required to see a patient? And the answer is no. You're not, Medicare does not say you're required to see a patient. What Medicare says is if you see the patient, you're required to bill. So if you continue to struggle and you make a decision that you no longer want to see this patient for administrative reasons, actually for anything not just related to MSP, that's okay. You've provided the services, you've tried, you've done your due diligence. So due diligence is gonna be key there. So please make sure that you have all of that. If you want more information on, you know, Medicare secondary payer and being required, uh, go ahead and take a look at this article right here. All right, what is our next tip? Our next tip is to stop determining the primary coverage. Now, I will tell you that one of the biggest things that's great about the primary coverage is that if you can determine it from a system, that can also then be used. Once the system is determined and you can figure out that they have primary coverage, then we can roll back into what Aline and I had talked about where you can either, you know, go to that and have them deny it, but you have to determine the primary coverage. This is where you want to ask the questions, okay? Um, Aline, am I breaking up again? I don't know what's going on here. Just slightly. Okay, so I'm gonna wait just a second. So again, here's some different sources that will help you. Now, I do want to remind you that the portal is the common one that many people use. I did give you the portal user manual. Keep in mind, this portal was updated just a few days ago, just, just a couple weeks ago. When that happened, the, word, the part of our address did change. It's now www.wpsgha.com. Previously, you would say www.medmed.wps.gha.com. The med has been removed. If you're having that issue, take it out. Um, that'll get you back to our website. Second, direct data entry does provide eligibility information. You can look at that. And third is the interactive voice response system right now. 
Now, I do want to say right now, because coming up, and I'm going to have a slide to remind you of this, that in just a few days, or a couple of months, actually, on January 1st, we're going to shut off the eligibility function and the interactive voice response system. This is a CMS item. This is something they're making us do for a test period of time. They're then going to evaluate whether or not they want to turn it back on. So we're going to shut it off, um, see how it goes, and see what other systems you guys have. So hopefully that does help you out. I really do recommend that if you haven't looked at the portal since the release, take a look at the portal get used to using it. It's actually um, got some more user-friendly navigation, though the information is there. It's just how you navigate around it. Yes, you can use these screen prints, and yes, you can verify this information with the parents. All right. Next is updating records. This one, I will tell you, is always a bit controversial and a lot of hard information on updating records. We've already had one question in what do you do and how do you get it done? So first someone said, whose responsibility is it to really update the record? And the answer is it's really the patient's responsibility. It is their record. Now, what we continue to hear, Aline and myself, is they don't do it. We can't get them to do it. We're not paying because of it. So if the Medicare record is showing inconsistent or if there is something added on there that was not previously, let me give you an example from a question. The record shows BC, BS, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. However, it also shows Blue Cross, Blue Shield spelled out. You would need to contact the benefit uh, uh, coordination, I'm sorry, you would need to contact the Benefit Coordination and Recovery Center or BCRC to get that updated, commonly referred to as the MSP contractor, it's one of two, and they'll have to update that to show, hey, it's really, you know, one plan. We can't do anything with it at your Medicare administrative contractor. So yes, a provider can have this updated. However, keep in mind, the updates are minimum. You must have something in writing from the primary coverage on some form of official letterhead or official information. You send that into the BCRC and they have 15 days to take it. If you continue to struggle with them and they're not taking it or whatever the situation is, we at your Medicare administrative contractor cannot help you. You must go to your CMS regional office for additional assistance. Until that is updated, we are stuck. We can't process your claim, okay? Um, so next one would be, what are your options? Again, we already went through these, but what your options if it's not updated? First, send a claim, let them deny it. Let that primary insurance deny it. Then bill Medicare saying, hey, they didn't pay it. Here's why they didn't pay it, we can then consider it. Two, get something on letterhead again and have that updated through that update system, which goes to the BCRC and it is available. What do you do when the patient will not update the records? Again, check your system, see if it's updated, see if it's current, see if it's been updated, or follow the previous advice. Follow the previous advice. Do not simply bill Medicare. That is not gonna work for you and you're not gonna get the result. You're gonna get the denial. Well, how does that help you? It does not, okay? Um, this provider received the following. Uh, it's a rejection code B7, I'm sorry, RB7516 status code expectations from the provider. Now this again would be if you're in the FIS or the Part A processing system. And there's a CMS publication on this. It's the Medicare Secondary Payer Manual, uh, which is uh, available to you. It is chapter five and section 60.1.3.2.1. That's uh, a lot. I'll see if a link can put that in the chat for you. Again, the Medicare Secondary Payer Manual 100-05 is an actual publication number. It is in chapter five and it is in section 60.1.3.2.1. And it says, we can't do anything unless further information is received before we can process it. What do you do? You must contact customer service to get that information to us. Now you can, you can also go in and adjust the claim in some situations. It depends on the tape to tape field and whether there's an X in that, but that's a lot more information than you'll need. So if you have questions and it does happen to you, I do recommend that you contact customer service. If you have additional information, they can look at how it's going to be best to get it to us. Here's the thing. If you do nothing and you wait for 75 days, we will deny this claim. Okay. We will deny this claim. 
what's this B, uh, RB75164, uh, RB75164 is designed for, is for a cost savings or a fraud and abuse prevention. In other words, we don't want to pay something and have to take it back. It's when there is potential MSP information, and therefore you must act accordingly. A claim will hold in this for 75 days. If you said, well, I just don't want to deal with it and I'm just going to let, let it sit there and wait, that's okay. Now, keep in mind, while we do use that number and when you talk about it from the FIS system, MCS, which is the 1500 and 837P, also has a hold location. You won't know the hold location, but it will go into this. CMS uses the same 75 days and then we deny it. You have to wait for the denial, otherwise it'll just hit duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. So depending on which system you bill, it will affect this. So hopefully all of that makes sense, but the record has to be up to date. Once the record gets up to date, then you need to contact customer service to find out which action you need to take, or you need to adjust the claim um, in terms of UB04 837I. If it's a 1500 or 837P, in most cases, you're gonna need to let that claim process out, deny, and then do something with it. All right, what's next? Next, if there was a lot of questions on billing. And um, so I thought I'd a six slide in, but really not get into in-depth detail. The reason we did this is because there are two complete encores that will cover all of this information. And here you can see they're listed on this slide. So, um, you know, how do you bill an MSP claim? Well, follow the instructions because there's two different styles of billing. Uh, it depends on how you bill. Now, in, um, are there, is there a difference for a swing bed claim and a skilled nursing facility claim? Nope, it's still gonna be MSP claim and your basic um, claims are still gonna be billed the same way. It's just some of the other things. If you're talking about a 1500, you wanna make sure you look at the one labeled MCS. If you're talking about an 837P, again, MCS. If you're talking about a UB04 or 837I, you wanna go with the FIS video. Don't mix the two up. It isn't going to work for you that way. All right. So please make sure you're following all of those. I want you to also look at when do you need to bill. And this is that second bullet down. One, you might want to bill just in case the primary takes their money back. That's especially if it's paid in full by the primary. You might want to. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying you might want to. Now, the exception to that is if it's paid in full and it's an inpatient claim, you still have to bill it because that affects the inpatient benefit period. It's the way in which we measure our inpatient utilization days and it has to be there. For outpatient claims, if it's paid in full, it's optional. I understand CMS says it's optional. I'm telling you as your Medicare administrative contractor, please take our advice and always bill these. We have a lot of times where someone comes back from the MSP and takes their money back and it's a year later and they're like, well, now we can't get it paid and it should be timely filing waiver. Medicare does not allow a waiver for this. Instead, they'll say, well, you should have billed it in the first place. Okay. The other time when you want to look at when you should really be billing these claims always is if there's an unmet patient deductible. I understand that the primary paid it in full, but if there's an unmet patient deductible, Medicare can credit that deductible amount even without the patient paying it. And that's one of the advantages to primary payers. Insurance types. Now we talked about how non-group health plans and group health plans all work and how different things can actually affect you. We wanna make sure that you get the correct insurance types on the claim. I will tell you someone said, hey, you left off an insurance type on here. I'm well aware that I left off federal black lung and that's because we don't see them that much. Usually the people that get, get for those, uh, we don't really have a lot of issues with those. So I didn't put it on here for that reason. Um, it's just not a common insurance type that we see. But if you're billing the insurance type, the type of insurance can actually drive us to list it correctly on the file or incorrectly on the file. So think about it. Some different types of insurances, though they have the same name, may be a low, no fault or liability for that state, depending, but they could also have a worker's plan that would go underneath that. So a patient may have that same insurance twice. 
also there are different states that would have something. So you could have Blue Cross Blue Shield of and insert the state, and then you could have a different one for a different policy, but it would be Blue Cross Blue Shield of, and it's a different state. So we want to make sure you're getting all of these numbered correctly. If you tell us that something is related to no fault as an example, but it is a worker's um, working age, which would be 12, what would happen? Anyone know? Well, let me just explain. We're going to put it on there again. Now you're going to have two files by the same name that are actually the same insurance, but because you labeled it incorrectly, someone has to do an investigation. What happens during that investigation? Every single claim for every single provider stops. Not just yours, every provider. So please make sure that you're labeling it correctly. Make sure that those insurance are done correctly. All right. Next, we want to talk just briefly about billing timely. And again, I did talk about this. You do need to bill them on time. Use the data service one year rule, data service or data discharge. Anything outpatient, it's one year from the data service. Anything inpatient, it's one year from the data discharge. Keep in mind that even if the primary paid it in full, we cannot go back and waive timely filing for this. That's not what it is. Um, you can, on the other hand, have a claim that is denied, filed timely, and we can do a reopening request to look at it. That's fine. However, you can't do an appeal request. It doesn't work that way. It has to be a reopening, which actually gives you one year from the denial, which is longer than the 120 days from the denial. So please make sure you bill them, and then you're aware of that. Next tip we were asked about is, do I have to... Do I have to bill the patient the liability? And the answer is yes. But how do I determine this? Okay, let's keep this as simple as we can. And when we look at it, one, there's a Medicare allowed amount or a contractual amount from the primary payer, whichever is lower. If you have that amount met, then you don't bill the patient for anything. If on the other hand, you do not have that amount met or you've received a lower payment, then you can bill the patient for something. So let's use the Medicare allowed amount and the primary payment or non-payment. Now, in this case, let's say the service occurred on January 15th and it was the first service of the year. The primary said, okay, you're contractually obligated to accept $115. Medicare went back and they applied all of that to the patient's deductible. Medicare went back and said, okay, our allowed amount is $87, but we're also going to apply that to the patient deductible. Which one do you bill? you bill the patient the Medicare allowed amount, it's lower. Now, on the other hand, if we look at it and we say, oh, wait, here's what happened in that situation. The primary paid $90, same, same dollar amount, right, 110. Let's use that. Primary paid $90. Medicare only allows $87. Okay, yep. What do we do with this? Well, the patient doesn't owe you anything because you've been paid more than the primary, or more by the primary than the Medicare allowed amount. Here's what you have to keep in mind. You're not obligated to return that money. Medicare says you can't collect from the patient. They don't say you can't collect from another insurance or someone else. They use a coordination formula that allows for that. So you're okay with it. Really what you want to do is look back at the, the lowest amount you're legally obligated to accept and determine if you have that amount of money in hand. If you do or you have more than that, then do not bill the patient. Okay. So yes, you do need to bill the patient when it is their liability. All right. Medicare payment half promptly paid period is a conditional payment. What this means is that you're waiting for payment. Something hasn't happened and the insurance hasn't done. What do you need to do to process primary? Yes, you can build Medicare. In the Part A world, you want to make sure you put your condition codes on and you get paid for this. In the Part B, or I shouldn't say Part A world, I should be, say uh, UB04 837Is. In the 1500 837Ps, it's going to deny and you're going to have to write in and ask us for a conditional payment. But the basic principle is that with a um, insurance other than employer-based plans, you can get additional money while you wait. So keep in mind, what we're looking for is how can we cover the patient? How can we do that? So you want to wait to build a patient for whatever the Medi Medicare says, but you will get the additional allowed amount. The difference is whatever the patient does. 
Now, if for any reason you did bill the patient, and some people do this and this is fine, the reason that we recommend that you wait is that you have to refund all the money back to the patient. And this can cause a lot of confusion and questions and other things that happen. Now, conditional payment, again, is just that. It's money given to you in the time that you're waiting once 120 days has passed for a final issuance. Uh, one of the examples that the person asked about was they have a claim from um, 300 days ago. That the claim that they filed um, relates to a service 300 days ago, but it has a car insurance and that is still in a legal battle with it. File the claim to us. We can deny the claim. Um, now, this person does file in a 1500. If you don't want to wait anymore for the revenue, you do have the right to then ask us to consider the claim for payment. Okay, that's great. What will happen during that is, yes, we will consider the claim for payment. Yes, we will issue everything. Yep, you can bill the patient. During that legal process, once everything is said and done, it'll come back out and go back to you. So hopefully that answers that question regarding conditional payment and why this slide was built in. Let's see. Uh, appeals disagree with the Medicare a lot amount of money. Yes, you can request an appeal. This does include overpayment appeals, and that's why we put this in here. But be careful when filing for an overpayment appeal, which typically happens with Medicare secondary payer situations, because you're not appealing a claim decision. You're appealing an overpayment decision. And so if it's worded wrongly, we see these dismissed a lot. So when you're talking about money that you owe Medicare, you're appealing the overpayment decision. Maybe here's the EOB or here's what happened with it. Here's the information you have, but please make sure you word this correctly. All right, uh, I did have some questions come in about workers' comp set-aside amounts. And set-aside amounts are after a legal situation happens and a legal ruling has occurred, there's money set aside for future claims, for future uh, medical claims. This is still primary to Medicare. A set-aside amount does not change that, um, it still goes. However, set-aside amounts are a limited funding, we understand that, so you do need to follow the guidelines if they run out. One, you can bill them and they can say, hey, there's no more money left, or two, you can get a letter from that set aside and say, hey, it's done. Here's the last day. Here's the last claim that was paid. We don't have any money left. And we will get that updated by contacting the BCRC. Um, I'm not sure what further questions you guys had on set aside amounts. So please put those back into the chat for me. Incarcerated patients, this one was added based on a question and, and is Medicare primary or secondary to the state custody or the governing body? And the answer is no, um, it doesn't work that way. If a patient is incarcerated and the governing body does not pay for any medical care, then we can consider it. If they do pay for medical care, then obviously they're gonna pay for it and it's not a secondary situation. However, if the patient is incarcerated, the governing body does not pay for it, and they have an insurance through a, through an employer-based plan, then yes, that can still be a primary payer situation. Um, this one gets a little bit more complex, but I wasn't really sure exactly what your question wanted, so that's what I have for you on this. Again, if you have more, please feel free, uh, feel free to ask us some more questions on this one. Um, the next thing we have is another question and answer session, and I know that I'm running a little bit over, I'm just hitting time, but because I did get started late, I do still want to offer you guys the opportunity for this question and answer session, um, and then we'll finish up with some resources from there. Now, again, these resources are all spelled out for you, so I will mention them and move on. So let's start with questions that we had submitted in chat this time versus questions that we had pre-submitted. Aline, anything? We have had a couple questions. So the first one is, let me scroll back up here. Uh, will Medicare pay if a patient has a Medicare Advantage plan that termed prior to their date of service? If not, can we bill the patient? And then they say the plan was active when they verified the insurance. So yes, Medicare will pay as long as it's within our record that that plan is now terminated for that date of service. It's going to have an effective and a termination date. So you may verify and it may look like it, right? But then later we receive information and that gets changed. Medicare will pay primary. Next question. Great. Thank you. And this one also has to do with um, Medicare Advantage. It says when someone has a Part C plan and needs and need to update the COB, do they call the Part C plan or Medicare? 
Um, so I can only tell you from the fee for service, they would contact the BCRC. Um, the, the Part C plan information is a separate processing system and they are not handled the same way. So you'll need to ask that question of the Part C plan to find out what they need to do with that. Um, there's no direct answer or no easily given answer from us for that question. Next question. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, because Part C is a replacement to Medicare and not primary or secondary. So I can see where people get confused about that. The next question says, in the past, we've billed a secondary claim to Medicare where the primary paid in full. Medicare paid zero, but then crossed over to the supplement on file who did pay and created a credit on the account. Is there a way to stop Medicare from crossing over to the supplement when the primary pays in full? So this is where we go back to the types of supplemental plans. So this is not going to be related to Medicare primary payer, Medicare secondary payer. This is what happens when Medicare is the primary and there's a supplemental plan. I'm going to give you a really brief answer, but I'm going to tell you if you want more, you're going to have to write in for this one. And this is all, uh, just because it's not really related to the topic. Here's the thing to remember. First, there are two types of supplement plans. One is a Medigap plan, and the, based on the, the crossover occurs based on the information you put in the claim. So that claim information then causes the crossover. These are separately contracted companies with CMS. They will only pay for whatever Medicare does um, leave patient liability. This should not be one of those. The other type of plan is a separate private company that writes it as a supplemental Medicare plan. They pay us to cross over those claims. We enter into a legal obligation, Medicare and them, into a legal obligation to send those claims over. We have a legal obligation to do so. We can only exclude claims that they are not paying for. So no, there is not a way for us to stop that from happening because of the legal obligation underneath that. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Do we have any more questions? There are no further questions at this time. Okay, so I'm going to go through just a couple of uh, the pre-submitted ones, um, and then we'll we'll go ahead and end for the day. How do we successfully bill from MSP for a patient under 65? What additional codes are needed? First, there is no additional code, but remember, it must be coded correctly with the type of insurance. There is a difference in the insurance type of codes. Okay, can you submit secondary claims electronically? Sure, you can. Our system accepts these every day. Now, keep in mind, if you're submitting to um, the um, multi-carrier system or MCS on a 1500 or an 837P, a tertiary claim where we are the third payer cannot be submitted that way. Don't like that. Now, sometimes people say, I can't do that with the FIS system or UBO4 837I, their system limitations. We can accept those in paper as well. So I really, yes, we do accept those. We do have articles and information available on those out there. Um, are the primary EOBs always required when submitting a secondary claim? And the answer is no, they're not always required. However, the information from those is required. So if you submit electronically, you can put certain pieces of information onto the actual claim, and that will count as submitting the primary insurance information. However, if we request documentation, you must be able to support what you coded onto the claim. So hopefully that answers that question. Last one, if a patient is, is at a slip, Sorry, if a patient is at a SNF in a hospice level of care, do providers bill the hospice or Medicare? Okay, keep in mind this is not related to MSP. MSP rules still apply. But the first question to ask is what is the condition that they're in the SNF for? Is it related to the hospice condition? If it is related to the hospice condition, then you bill the hospice. If it is not, then you'll bill Medicare. So what do they have, what's going on with their body and what's related and unrelated? And that becomes a bigger issue, but there's a whole separate class on that. So check out our Encore presentations for more information. All right, we'll go ahead and move on here. We'll get done here. Again, there's a lot of resources out there and I didn't want to try to like show you all these different resources because we do have something called MSP resources. It's a class that we teach on just finding these different things. So these will help you through the different resources that you have available to you. Uh, lots of different ones here. Uh, these are CMS resources. We then move on and we should provide a slide on WPS resources um, and just a lot of pieces of information that hopefully will help you get through what you need. Um, after the WPS resources, just be aware that um, that each resource does kind of work together. So you want to make sure you're aware of that and that you are uh, following the CMS resources first. Anything WPS offers is supplemental to CMS. 
We've done all of our questions, so I didn't see any to stop there and do some more questions because we didn't have any. So here we go. Uh, things to keep in mind. We talked about this briefly, but again, the interactive voice response or the IVR system, it's that telephone system you call and you try to get data from it, try to get eligibility, claim status, et cetera. This is going away. Uh, it will be removed on January 1st, 2025 for eligibility. The overall system will remain, you'll still be able to get certain pieces of information, but eligibility will be shut off. Again, this is a test pilot from CMS. They'll evaluate whether or not this works. All right, want more information? Use the change request number down there, 13754. If, if you need a proof of attendance or you need um, certificates for CEUs, continuing education units, this will come out in an email pretty much following this um, this class. It may already have been sent out being that we're running a few minutes over. But inside this email, you will see the certificate of achievement on the bottom. So you can take that, use that. It's gonna give you one contact hour. That's our total course instruction time. It will give you the course name and all of that. Save this down, use that to upload. Okay. It does contain a link to the survey and it does contain a variety of other pieces of information. So you wanna be aware of that. So follow-up questions. I will take follow-up questions from you. Um, I know that we did, uh, we tried to get through everything. As far as I know, we got through everything, but please email those in to us. PS period GHA period education at WPSIC.com. Today's topic would be um, MSP tips and webinar, however you want to label that, but we want to make sure we get that information to you. Okay, send any claim specific questions to customer service. We can't answer those. Unfortunately, we aren't allowed system access to look those up. You'll need to send those to customer service. In the email that you'll receive, also in the chat, you'll be given a link, but we really want your survey feedback. Um, I understand that we did have some technical issues and hopefully you know, you're know you aware of that and you're saw that I did the best to struggle through this with Alina's, with Alina's help, I appreciate that. But tell me, you know, what did you think I did well? What did you think I didn't do well? Um, did you like the PowerPoint, the good, the bad, the ugly, all those types of things? What else would help you? Also, please include any further topics you'd like to see. It doesn't have to be related to MSP, but anything else you'd like to see. We're gonna uh, go ahead and send that out to you, but again, you can take it right now um, in the chat if you wanna use that link, otherwise you'll have to wait. And there will be, a. Uh, um, external site blink up, or I'm sorry, external open. There will be a pop-up linking you to the external site. The pop-up looks like on the right side of our right picture, um, but you can go ahead and click on that. It's not spam, it's not malicious, it's not anything like that. It's just WebEx letting you know that we wanna take you to this site and that is the survey. Last but not least, thanks for attending. Thanks for your time today. We appreciate you sticking with us through the technical difficulties and all the other things that we've had happen. We hope that you did get some useful information out of this. Again, if you didn't or you have questions or you want some more, um, one, send us an email. Two, take the survey, help us know what you found useful, what you didn't find useful. So with that said, thank you for attending. We hope that you have a great day. We hope that you'll complete the survey and provide us with as much feedback as you can, whether that's through the live event or through the Encore presentation. We hope that you'll attend future events with us. Thanks everybody, you may now disconnect.